Hi, I'm Andy and welcome to this session from Ellie Publishing on visual literacy in English language teaching. A great excuse to talk about images and videos in the classroom for any ages and any level and I think we all like to do that as teachers. And visual literacy is a term we hear a great deal now. I thought I would look at that more closely. What does that actually mean and what are the implications for it for English teachers who often say, well, visual literacy is all very well but I teach grammar. Let's look at that too. Um, you know, I thought I would just begin with something I saw in the news today uh, or recently. And actually, it doesn't matter how old this video becomes. This, like, look at the size of this TV screen. Look at the size compared to that woman and the child. And it says everything about the world we're living in, both in terms of technology and just the scale in every sense of images in our world. We inhabit a very visual world, 27 feet of TV, 1.2 million. And again, if this video gets old, I'm not sure the price will come down anytime soon. I would love a home cinema because we are bombarded with images. We are bombarded by different shapes and sizes of screens. And we know this and um, it's just too good to ignore. In fact, it's not even just something we use in the classroom if we have time or if it helps us. It seems to be so fundamental. A visual environment is so fundamental to our lives now. It, it absolutely belongs in the classroom in many different ways. And of course, when we think about how we get our students to communicate, writing or certainly speaking, images and videos are the way to go. And it's not hard to see them or find them. And they're everywhere. Look at that. There's the car down there. That's Google Maps. You can even see the street view of things, selfies, all the platforms we use. And crucially for visual literacy, it's not just being exposed to images of different kinds. It's how we then respond to them, uh, create them, adapt them, and then share them. So visual, the visual world is a language, a visual language of communication. And we are communication teachers. And so receiving and creating and sharing images is very much what we're doing now anyway. And that's absolutely what visual literacy is about. It's not just seeing a picture, describing it, and we move on as teachers. It's, you know, what does that mean? What is, what is it trying to say to us? How do we respond? How would we use that to communicate a message to somebody else? Look at that. Someone's holding a GoPro there underwater. That looks fun. Um, and someone there is making a sort of possibly a TikTok video. Are you on TikTok? Do you find yourself endlessly scrolling through videos or even just on Instagram? You know, it's interesting how things like Instagram, TikTok and Snapchat kind of overtook, you know, using texts originally like Twitter and Facebook to simply send messages or share ideas. Now we just seem to be consumed by images. And that is a goldmine of opportunities for resources for teachers. And, and we know that. But I think that what I can do today is show examples of how that can sit alongside our course book materials and use it to get the students talking. <laughs> I, I'm going to show you this picture quickly. I, I took this in the traffic the other day. Um, I live in Scotland, in Glasgow. I'm English and I live in Scotland. And I thought this was a dog. When I was driving earlier, the car was further in the distance and I thought it was a real dog and I was worried that the dog was going to jump out in front of me. Um, and I, and I, when I stopped at the red light, I realized the dog was not real. And then I wondered what it was made of. Um, and then I could see the word carving. You see that? It's from the company there called Caledonian. That's to do with Scotland. Chainsaw. We, well, that sounds like a pretty um, serious piece of equipment and carving. So I quickly worked out the dog is made of wood. And I just suddenly thought, this is something I would do as a teacher. You know, I keep pictures all the time. We all do. We find weird things, hopefully attention grabbing things around us and ask your students to do the same or rather they help. They're doing it anyway. Let's get them to share with us and start to think about what we could do with this picture uh, rather than just describing it. In the old days of using flashcards and pictures or illustrations in the course book, We'd simply describe, you know, what can you see? The dog is in the car, the car's on the road, prepositions. Um, where might it be? It, it, it could be in a city. It could be in a town. Um, what's going to happen? Well, it's going to be a green light. The car's going to move. I mean, that's language, isn't it? I mean, you could think about asking students questions or they could ask each other questions. You know, why, why is that dog there? You could maybe hide 
the words chainsaw and carving, which is they're quite advanced words. I wonder why is it because the man likes dogs or the woman likes dogs or whoever's driving? Uh, are they trying to give you a warning? Um, what is that about? And it makes us curious. And so with curiosity, we could do a bit more deeper thinking about um, the picture. But I just thought that was very sweet. Actually, I went to the Facebook page and yes, they carve things from wood with a chainsaw. And I've actually seen them do it. I know where that is in Glasgow. Another idea, by the way, is if you are finding images like this and keep your eyes open for them, they're not hard to see. Maybe put one on the whiteboard whenever the students come in for every lesson, or maybe they could share ones with you. And then that's the way you start the lesson. The students are coming in, they're settling down and they can see oh, what's, uh, what's the teacher today? What's Andy got today on his whiteboard what's he going to do today and of course the lesson's all planned out but this gets them thinking and warmed up nicely so um here's another one this is a picture from the news again recently it doesn't matter this video gets older the picture still does what i need it to do which is in this case hide some of the picture i took it from the times newspaper um, and the students again would be thinking on a superficial level what are they doing what can you see uh, there's water, there's uh, pavement, there are, I see some legs, I can see some brushes, uh, the water, is it dirty, is it clean, you know, uh, and then I reveal a bit more, and then maybe the students can be thinking about where this might be, both in terms of country or even a sort of location in the country, it looks uh, formal, um, so those trees look quite neat, so is it something like a special place? And of course, it is a special place. It's the Taj Mahal. Uh, the students might know that, they might not. And of course, the picture is much more than this is the Taj Mahal. Uh, there is, um, There are some people in the picture. It, it has an effect, doesn't it? When I saw this picture, I thought, that's really, that's a great picture. Um, you could say that to the students and they might go, why? And some students would start to think about it. It's quite a jarring picture, isn't it? You've got the majesty of that lovely building. Uh, have you been there? I've never been there. Um, and then these people working hard, you know, they don't look very majestic. They are workers cleaning, I think, the, the pool. Um, and um, I think that makes the students probably think a bit more differently than just a picture of the Taj Mahal and where is it and what's the capital of India? This is, you know, what would it, what what are these people thinking maybe? Do they like their job? How long does it take to clean? What do they earn maybe? And these are the critical thinking questions that would arise in a classroom or what we want to do more as we engage the students to think and respond and communicate. And I just find so many pictures like this in the news. If you look at the Times, um, you have to pay for the Times, but you can find it in The Guardian. I'll show some sources later. You can see the news in pictures in many newspapers, maybe in your own country too. And just find some that catch the attention to get students to see that visual literacy is very much about um, reading the picture. What is the picture trying to tell us? How do we feel when we look at that picture? And when we encounter these sorts of pictures in course books, we want the same thing too. We don't want to feel that the picture is just sitting there to make the text look nice. We want to do more um, with that. Now, why is, why is everything so visual? Well, you know, the brain has always responded faster to images. It kind of makes sense that we uh, respond with images, I suppose. I mean, if you think about, sometimes I text people and I send a picture or an emoji, don't you? And then we, that, that's faster, because we're lazy, aren't we? And also, it, you know, that old cliche about a picture saying a thousand words, um, that's why um, we can immediately see a meaning. You know, look at that picture there with the, the chap and the uh, young girl or young woman looking at something there. Uh, we know what's going on there without me describing anything. Um, and of course, that also makes me think as a picture, we can go beyond what they're doing. They're waving, they're watching uh, maybe a video uh, of someone talking to them. You could maybe explore with the, the students. Who are they? What, uh, what are they thinking? Are they happy? Yeah. Why? Who's on the other end? Who's talking to them? What could that be about? So that deeper level of thinking is what we want when we look at pictures. Um, and of course, you can feel just how much can come out of the students to be elicited from them 
to engage them with these images. Um, and it enhances a deeper meaning, of course, you know, if you have uh, flashcards from the old days or using picture dictionaries or just any way to attach images to learning. It's universal. Images speak to everybody. They're memorable. Okay. How many times do you look back on your smartphone? Well, actually, how many times do you look back and see all those pictures you've taken? But when you do, like a time hop in Facebook, when it makes you remember what happened six years ago and how much younger you looked, it's memorable, isn't it? And look what happens when you see those photographs. They, they make you feel something. Oh, my goodness. So it's more than memory, isn't it? It's triggering emotions. Um, but it's obviously enjoyable. We love pictures. We love films. I mean, film. That's a whole topic in itself with students. How do they watch films? How do they watch films? Where do they watch them? When do they watch them? And how does it make them feel? And of course, like I said earlier, a meme, an emoji, or some quick GIF, a G-I-F, a GIF, a sort of mini moving image to capture a response to send to somebody. And these are all happening in what we call now the information age. So much information now is out there. So what do we mean by visual literacy? Well, the ability to read, write, and create visual images. And it's about language, communication, interaction, a linguistic tool with which we communicate, exchange ideas, and navigate our complex world. How can we get the students to respond, even create and adapt, and communicate and share those? Now, visual literacy and its basic elements is really to get students to be aware of how they, they are navigating images and videos all day, but doing it perhaps more carefully with more critical thinking um, to understand what images are doing, uh, how they can sort of respond to those images, what that's making them feel, what does somebody want to say by using a video or an image, and how they then create images. Um, what are they trying to do with their images and videos? And uh, of course, if we think in terms of a global language, what does that mean for interacting with others in a global language of English? Um, with images and with video, or even, of course, discussing them, which we want to do, not just for the exam, not just for the classroom, but because this is the reality, isn't it? We discuss images and videos and films with others. And if we're preparing students for the real world, then they need to do, I think they need to know how to do this in um, a global language. So why should we uh, consider visual literacy in English language teaching? Um, well, you know, as I said earlier, we're not just language teachers, we're communication trainers, aren't we? It sounds grand, but we don't just list grammar and vocab items for the exam. That's not really what English is about. It's what school does, but we're really preparing students for the real world. And a, the real world is a, a very visual one and one where they're going to be communicating in English in many different scenarios. Um, we're visually orientated, aren't we? As babies, we watch and we learn, so we're wired up. The brain loves uh, image, and um, it's also, you know, something we've done forever in the classroom. So it's not really a big jump. I suppose visual literacy is becoming more of a uh, a loaded term because we want students to be able to navigate the world, as I said, respond uh, to the images. Um, so it's really an extension of using um, images in the classroom the way we've always done. But of course, the beautiful thing is now that students can create images. They know maybe more than we do what to do, and that can be a great tool, a great source for the classroom. As I showed you earlier, we can motivate or provoke students with images, um, and visual literacy would be, for example, looking at that picture of those people cleaning the pool or the fountain area of the Taj Mahal and thinking more deeply about you know, the contrast of the majesty of that building and how you feel cleaning the, the fountain of that building, you know, would you want to be the, the person inside the building or do you want to be cleaning it? How does that feel? Of what You know, the, these are the things we want students to be thinking about. Critical thinking, really. Um, visuals are memorable and they're fun. Of course, we can have a lot of fun with videos and pictures in the classroom. And yeah, I think that there's so much now um, available for us to expose students to other cultures. Um, and I'll look at some examples there too because that's one of the great joys of the internet in the classroom um, when it comes to teaching English and teaching students that it's a global language. The implications for using that language across cultures leads us to intercultural skills beyond the surface of the culture. 
Yeah, critical thinking could also be looking at fake news, uh, maybe images that have been, you know, uh, changed for, for whatever purpose. And that would be a discussion as well, wouldn't it? Or deep fake videos which are uh, created to make it look like somebody is saying something when in fact they really didn't. Deep fake videos are a danger to watch in the future. And I think I'd pick out storytelling today. There are more things I could say here about visual literacy and ELT. And by all means, I think, please Google visual literacy and education generally. And it throws up all sorts of useful things to think about and uh, ideas and activities. Um, and I think storytelling, of course, is great, you know, to mention in this area because we can use images to get students to tell stories and follow stories. Now, I just want to stop at this point and make a couple of um, points about, you know, using images and video. You can really do a lot with them, but of course, you should stay focused on the language aim. Otherwise, the lesson could be too long, it could be boring, and it might even lose focus. So remember, when you are choosing images and videos, to really think about what is the aim of this lesson? However good the video is, and however good the image, what am I trying to do with the language? What is the task, and is it clear? And that's absolutely crucial that we don't go in with something we think was a pretty good picture and the students just weren't sure what they're doing or even if it was a meaningful task. We don't want to do English tasks just for the sake of it. We want them to be responding and communicating in another language, but really talking about who they are and what they feel. So let's go to story illustrations. Let's start with the younger ones too, although, you know, images aren't just for kids. Um, here's a typical page from the beginning of a book. Um, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, and just to take away the distraction of the text, um, I blocked out the text because what I want to do there is get the students to uh, practice some visual literacy with uh, a, a cartoon. Um, so on the surface, we could ask the students what they see, you know. You could even hide the picture for 20 seconds and ask the students what they remember. Or the students could have maybe uh, work in pairs and have, you know, half the picture each and one has to describe to the other and they could maybe even draw working together the, the overall image and that's a very sort of surface area uh, approach to using an image but look here you know you could point to this and say to the students what what is this what do you think it is um, whenever I've done this lesson with teachers everybody thinks it's a pizza which is a reasonable thing to say but it's not I can tell you it's an egg Sooner or later, somebody will guess that it's an egg. And this is the beginning of a story. So this leads me to think with the students about predicting. So another area of visual literacy could be to sort of go beyond this to what is this picture saying? Why, why show us a picture of a young girl pointing to an egg? And that isn't really an ordinary egg. So let's think about what kind of egg could it be? And if you're thinking it looks like a dinosaur egg, you'd be absolutely right. Um, now, the images I took from the book, there are many, but uh, here are a few in order, actually, but you could mix them up. That's another way of working with images to see if they can follow the story and put the pictures in the right order. It turns out in the story that uh, because it's a dinosaur egg, uh, the teacher takes them to the museum, then she has her own egg <laughs> and she puts it in the oven, as you do with eggs. And look what she gets. She gets a little dinosaur. But then, oh, what does that picture on the end mean? What does that mean? Why would she put it in a dark basement in a box? Um, the students might say, well, it's her pet. And you go, do you keep all your pets in the basement? You know, thinking more critically or more widely about the image. And they'd say, well, maybe she's afraid somebody would find it. She's hiding it, you know. So, again, no, I don't think this is necessarily new. I think many of you out there would be teaching like this, but if you're new to teaching, or maybe you haven't thought about this with pictures and readers, this is from a graded reader, um, maybe it's something to think about. You know, It's certainly a good way to think about pictures and images before they read the story. Some, some teachers will just read the story or the students read out loud, but warm them up. And you could warm them up by showing them something like this, what could it be about and then what's going to happen and before you know it a lot of the text has been elicited from you and the students before they even read so you know using images to tell stories is um this is a great way to get them into the story there's the book itself dr Dumuch and the dinosaur egg of course i could have shown that picture first um but it would give away the dinosaur egg so i might just sort of block out just the woman and that the egg and make the students wonder this is the cover from the book 
what do you think it's going to be about? You know, what does she do? Is she a doctor? Is she a, a teacher or is she an explorer? <laughs> OK, you get the idea. And here's one from uh, another book I like from Ellie's Readers. Um, I hope you use readers more with your students. Um, a fabulous way to get students to sort of feel the language, because the more you read at or below your level will give you a sort of a feeling for the language that you just don't get with course books, which can make you feel that it's just like exercises. In Uncle Jack and the Amazon Rainforest, I've picked a couple of pictures here. So with a class, again, I could get them to describe what they see. Uh, maybe there would be three different groups in my class and one would know what they see. Um, again, I could hide them and ask the students to remember as much as possible. But again, you know, from a visual literacy perspective, I could get them to start to think about, you know, what the thoughts and feelings are of the, of the, of the characters here and what could their relationship be and what's he putting that that man with the children and the dog what he's carrying a box what, what's in the box do you think and what is that he's putting it into when it turns out to be a, a hot air balloon why would they get into a hot air balloon and what happens and what are those creatures there in the bottom picture and so on so this is all about exploring the images and as i talk and i hear myself talking i'm aware that that's just not me as a teacher i would really want the students to give me as much as possible as input and in their own language if they're struggling because I think if you let them or make them speak English all the time the weaker students are going to feel just lost and they're not going to make contributions and I want students contributing so this would be a great way and I know that there's a lot of controversy about using mother tongue in the classroom but why make it so hard the lesson has is really is not happening yet this is just getting used to talking about the images a little bit i want to find out what they feel and respond and then give them the language so let's not make it too hard after all this is a younger a younger age group but i don't think you should make it hard just because they get older in fact if anything they need more motivation of course we learn in that story that it's about sloths and a sanctuary um, in fact maybe you could start the whole introduction to the book with this picture you know, what is a sloth sanctuary? Could the students look up a picture of a sloth, connect it with the real world? So a whole wide range of ideas and thoughts coming from there. And one more example, the 39 steps. You could show the cover here. The title doesn't give away the story at all. In fact, it makes us curious. And again, a visual text. That is a visual text, isn't it? What's he doing? Uh, how, how is he driving? Where is he driving? What is he driving? How is he feeling? Does he look happy? Or is he on holiday? Is he on a business trip? Um, is it safe? Is it dangerous? Can you see 39 steps? No. So what does that mean? So again, car, man, mountains, but then we start to explore a bit more with it. <laughs> look at him there, struggling now, isn't he? Is he happy? What's he doing? What's happened? Present perfect, look, what's happened? Again, you know, as I said earlier, course book illustrations can be more than just decoration. Uh, there is an image. You, again, you might want to just hide that picture, let the students remember what they see. Could they remember how many people are in the picture? Could they remember who was wearing what? Uh, how many crowns did they see? You know, that's a nice way of getting them to think about the picture. Uh, but that leads to um, the next part of the book, which is a comic strip. Now, comic strips are a really good way of storytelling, aren't they? And this is about the princess receiving different gifts. And this is from a digital version of uh, the Story Garden course. So we could take a look at that video now and see how we could work with that. So even here, you could just let this title show and uh, ask students about their birthdays and maybe think about what gifts Sleeping Beauty might want or get as they watch this video. Happy birthday! A present for the princess. So I can pause it here and students can start to guess what the present is. Thank you! You can get them to repeat. Thank you! What is it? What is it? They can also repeat the questions. It's a ball. Then we can also find out if anyone was right. Who guessed that it was a ball?
Is it for me? No. Is it for me? No. So this is a script, of course, that we can then maybe give to the students and they can maybe do the voiceover. Maybe they can play the video and you can turn the sound off and maybe they can do the dialogue for you. For the princess. Oh, thank you. Oh. <laughs> A present for the princess. So again, I'm pausing it. Maybe the students can guess this one. Thank you. What is it? It's a kite. Is it for me? No, it's for the princess. Oh. Oh, thank you. <laughs> now a present for you. Hmm, now can the students guess this present? A present for me? Yes. <laughs> that should make them giggle. <clears throat> now, let's consider some of the global issues around images. Look at this one here. This is unfortunately a real, um, a really common and uh, highly topical area of wild weather, climate change. And in the lessons, it is important that they are prepared for what is happening in the world. And then, of course, exchanging information and ideas and maybe even working in that sphere later on in their yeah, lives. Now, if we're going to use images and think about visual literacy in the classroom, it would be kind of boring just to open this page and then follow the exercises. That would be kind of not very creative. I mean, it's a nice layout, but we can do more with that. What I would do here is I would take out the images with my smartphone or a scanner or use the digital book from Ellie and you know just crop them and make this more of an opener. Students can see the images here. Those three questions below will give you a start to make them do more than describe what they see. And anyway, isn't that a, a nice kind of cleaner, more focused start to a lesson really? And also some some you know, wider thinking to be done. Again, I might do this in both English and a little bit of the mother tongue, because I want students, here's the work. They're going to work hard here, aren't they? But why why not make it a little easier? Let them explore with you ideas and thoughts. And as they give you words and expressions, or they want to know how to say something in English, you can hear what they want to say in their own language, write the words down and come back to them. So this is how images can, look at that one there, look at that one of the young girl with the fan. What could that be about? Heat waves or uh, the one here with the, the building that's been destroyed. Sadly, been so many images lately in the news and there always will be, I think, from um, storm damage. Um, culture, I mentioned earlier, again, this uh, comes from either course books or graded readers. Ali Publishing has a series of graded readers called Real Lives um, from different uh, countries, different kids in different countries. Again, I took the text away from the page, just kept the images. And we could simply say, you know, this girl is eating, she's eating rice, she's eating her breakfast, she's eating lunch, we don't know. And there we already have a start to being visually literate. Where could she be from? And, you know, what what does this kind of food look like to you? Have you eaten food like this? And how... How do you feel about food that's different to yours? Um, where is she going? She's dressed up. Is it school? Is it a wedding? Um, this comes from uh, Naoko My Japan from the Real Lives um, series. And uh, again, there's the text alongside it. But rather than making the students read and do comprehension, I want them to think about the culture here, food, cultures, countries. Uh, and maybe some of the language that we know is going to appear in the text, 
but by using this as a prompt, we're going to elicit from the class the very language that we know will appear in the text to some extent. Here's another one. Again, this has the text removed uh, just so I can use the image. And I love that picture. And the students would have to maybe think about where they're going. It looks like school again. Um, how do they go to school? Look at that. That is a tuk-tuk van. A tuk-tuk. T-U-K. T-U-K. And I would like to know, if I was in a live group with you, what's the most unusual way that you know students go to school? Or are there any unusual ways? This is, and look how many people, are, I mean, do they all get in that van? One, one, two, three, four, five, six. Six kids, possible. And I've been in a tuk-tuk van in India, so they really move very quickly. That's from Discover Sri Lanka with us. And of course, these pictures give us a chance to compare cultures. So we, we have in these materials from Ellie a chance to exploit those images and let them, in this case, think about intercultural skills. Now, you could take a picture. I took this picture from the video we're about to see. And uh, you could, this is the beginning of the video, and you could ask the students to think about, well, what questions would you ask them? What would you do with your students if you had this picture? You could ask where uh, he, where he is, where what he's going to see, uh, what what's his job, you know? So let's take a look at that uh, video with maybe a couple of gist questions. Adi Adepitan is on an adventure. He's travelling to Ghana to find out what happens to all the second-hand clothes people from Europe don't want. Oh my word! That shirt that you gave away last week, or those trousers, or those unwanted shoes, have ended up here. It's good stuff! This is the best quality! Ralph Lauren, wow. Even though we give away our second-hand clothes for free, some of the world's poor... So, we were in Ghana. Uh, we know that he's now in a market with lots of clothes. So already, you know, uh, you can see the students might be asked to identify later on what they remember in the clothes uh, that they saw here. Okay, let's le let's keep playing on. These people pay good money for them. Why don't you buy Ghanaian clothes? Why are you only buying second-hand European clothes? I don't have money. Money is small. So this video is about sort of second-hand clothes, clothes that have been sent over to Ghana to be recycled. And of course, what's great here in this video is it's non-native speakers of English. Or in Ghana, there is a use of English and also they have their own languages. But I think it's important here as well in the video that they just also are exposed to, you know, nothing. So let's take a look at the video now, and you could ask the students to think about. So let's take a look at the video now and see. So let's take a look at this video. It's about three minutes and uh, maybe have the students think about what they were asked at the beginning, which is where he might be and what he's doing. OK, that could be the sort of gist questions. Adi Adepitan is on an adventure. He's travelling to Ghana to find out what happens to all the second-hand clothes people from Europe don't want. Oh my word! That shirt that you gave away last week, or those trousers, or those unwanted shoes, have ended up here. It's good stuff! This is the best quality! Ralph Lauren, wow. Even though we give away our second-hand clothes for free, some of the world's poorest people pay good money for them. Why don't you buy Ghanaian clothes? Why are you only buying second-hand European clothes? I don't have money. Money is small. Yes. Me manga salon. Foes no manage home. Manage home. Na yaku amplit. Ya pamle data.
Addy meets some locals who spend their time making changes to the second-hand clothes. So what's going on here? Excuse me, sir. Could you tell me what you're doing, please? I'm ironing. Ironing. You've got to love this place. There's a guy just over there who's turning trousers into skirts. You've got this guy here who's adding dye to jeans, making old second-hand jeans look brand new. You've got this guy who's ironing. You've got a whole mini factory all based around second-hand clothing. Addy travels to the countryside, where he speaks to an historian about the cultural importance of traditional clothing in Ghana. There were times that we could not read and write, and so we were keeping our history uh, in the clothes that we, we were. So are, are traditional prints still as popular, not just kente, but the traditional clothing? Second-hand clothing um, brought in from Europe and America, it's cheaper, far cheaper. If we are not very careful, sometimes, somewhere, someday, we would have to, we would not see some of our own things anymore. Addy travels to the city to find out what people there think about traditional clothing. Could we have a show of hands, right? If you were going out on a Saturday night, how many of you here would wear traditional clothing to on a Saturday impress, night? Definitely. A couple of years back, it was cool to be only European. Now it's cooler to be African. Addy discovers that even if second-hand European clothes are popular, it's much cooler to be African. I love that video, and I am pleased that there's so many of those videos in the uh, Ready for Planet English course. Uh, you'll notice that there's all we've got non-native speakers uh, talking there. We've got a Ghana accent, we've got his British um, or one variety of British accent, and of course that's great, isn't it? Just when we're watching videos, we are listening, so videos just provide us with listening. But it's important that students are exposed to other worlds and how people sound in those worlds. Um, if you think the topics involved here, what could we do? We've got fashion. They talk about what people like to wear when they go out. Recycling, okay, and a wider implication of, of the video for discussion would be maybe students thinking about uh, what they do with anything that they throw away in their household. Have they thought about how much they throw away? Could they investigate, you know, where their clothes go when they recycle them? Do they give away their clothes? Um, and then they can maybe do projects from there, of course. Um, students could then look at maybe how they could recycle or sort clothes if they were doing it. On another basic level, you could have students try and remember what they uh, remember in the video. You just play it through once, and all they have to do is, in pairs or groups, brainstorm what they remember. Perhaps when you're playing the video, let me just go back to a bit there. And play it. As we're watching the video, what you could do in the classroom, uh, if you're in the physical classroom, you could have the students work in pairs and then A watches and B can't watch, but partner A will describe what they see. So the sound is turned down. So you turn the sound down. Let me see if I can do that. Play it. And student A is describing, oh, there are people, they, are, they have many clothes, they're sorting the clothes. The man is talking to us. They're cutting something there. They are, there are so many clothes. Okay, and then when uh, you can pause the video, partner B can then watch and describe. I mean, that's just a good way to get students maybe to, to start working with the video at the very beginning. But of course, as you can see, you've got so many visual clues for language work, specifically colors, clothes, um, verbs. You know, you've got present continuous there as well. And of course, actual words and phrases and sentences the students can repeat from the uh, from the video but also as a discussion as a sort of uh, platform for them thinking about wider global issues this is what it looks like in the textbook um, you have the video up there you could play that on the digital version of the book uh, or it would be on the uh, the DVD for the pack and then you can use the exploitation here 
as a traditional course book approach, and that's great. But like I said, if you just look at a video and think about the different ways in which we can work with visual literacy, we're still doing our job. We're still getting the students to communicate and think uh, in English without being too bogged down in you know specific exercises. So I thought I'd finish here by guiding you towards some images to maybe supplement your course book. If you go to Unsplash, that's a free resource. Most of the many, many pictures are free to use. Um, you can go to, like I said earlier, the newspapers, The Guardian and the UK is still a free paper online. If you look at the news in pictures, um, I mean, look at that. There, there are, I just, every day I look at them all. Um, the Guardian, The Times, The Independent, they're always so striking. What's she looking at? Where is she? What's that on the board? You know, and doesn't she look beautiful, that lovely red costume? Um, Flickr.com ELT Picks, that's a brilliant resource of images posted by teachers for teachers for English. So you can search by um, adjectives or prepositions or structures or idioms, phrasal verbs, ELT Picks. Have a look. Um, Canva.com, if you're not familiar with it, have a look, have a play. It's a superb way of turning images into anything, you know, adverts, brochures, posters, oh, you name it. Um, great, great resource there for you to do more. And of course, you can add text to your images so you can start to create things. And, you know, if you have your own Facebook group at school, you can post them, practice their English with their images. I love Toontastic. <laughs> Toontastic is a way of very simple way of making cartoons. Uh, you there's a, a free version of it, and the students can go into a series of templates. Here is an underwater scene. You choose characters. You record your own voice. And maybe, for example, if I was doing a reader or a, a story with you in the class, um, the students might want to recreate that story uh, in a cartoon animation. Beautiful, Toontastic. Um, the Great Big Story is a vast collection of free mini documentary videos. So the sort of videos you've just seen now, you can find a lot more out there for free on YouTube, of course. We could all find those, but here is a nice focused uh, portfolio of all kinds of topics. They're beautifully short and many, many topics involved. And the British Council also, of course, have a wide resource of video. Uh, resources with lessons so all of these things are important you know it's it's good to use the course book it's, it's a plan for what we're doing but these other resources will help us find more content to enhance the learning make it more fun and get them thinking and communicating um, so that brings us to the end of the presentation Ellie Digital have a look online at what the uh, digital offerings are from Ellie uh, certainly the interactive um, Students' books and workbooks um, on the platform are really ideal for any remote teaching or blended learning. And there's online resources from the website as well. And included in some of the teachers' books are tips on blended learning and remote learning, should you be working in any sort of remote situation or hybrid teaching scenario. And there's this beautiful Ellie, Ellie Link app, which is a free app on any smartphone. And when you point the camera, at the page for which the link works, the audio will pop up and you can download the audio files. That's the Ellie Link app. And of course, Ellie has languages beyond English and of course, different websites will help you understand that they have magazines, readers, games. So oh, they have fantastic games. And of course, ellieonline.com is the main website where you can also register for newsletters and free resources and updates on webinars by me and other colleagues out there. So thank you for watching, thank you for listening to this talk on visual literacy in ELT, and I hope you found that useful. Good luck, and I'll speak to you again soon.